Yeah, it was mostly hike. Yeah, it was That's mostly hike. We, did, we didn't want to, we didn't want to drive through the squeeze. Yeah. yeah. We saw the squeeze and we go, oh, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. 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 Yeah
I was reading it on Kindle, so I can't give you the page. Um, but uh, it's somewhere in there. He talks about um, some specific Bible events previously doubted and even re- ridiculed have been verified. The impact of this is shown in the observation of one scholar that it is a rare biblical passage that has not been questioned by someone. So um, things that have been ridiculed in the past, archaeology will it'll get discovered and they'll be like, oh, that person exists, that city exists, that people group exists. And so that's one of the things it accomplishes for the Bible. It silences the critics very often. The second thing it accomplish, accomplishes is it illuminates biblical background. And he continues in uh, Know Why You Believe, the overall background of the culture and practices in general of the biblical times was filled in. Such things as economic problems and literally literary development describe the word to which the Old Testament prophets spoke. So it's really cool because archaeology can bring a lot of enlightenment to how things worked out, especially in some of the studies when you're getting to things like Masada and others where um, you can actually put like a location to it, know um, what it might have looked like. So archaeology, a lot of times, it illuminates the text we have because sometimes uh, the author in the Bible will not describe the area for us and so it gets Um, illuminated by archaeology. So that's a really cool thing that archaeology does. The third thing that archaeology does is it clarifies contradictions. Some points of apparent conflict between the Bible record and the information previously available have been surprisingly cleared up as more information has been obtained. It would seem then that when apparent conflicts still exist, rather than conclude that the Bible must be wrong, a more reasonable position would be to admit the problem exists and to hold it open pending further discoveries. A perfect example of this is when Jesus healed the blind man in Jericho. And in the uh, Gospel of Mark, it says um, that he was going into Jericho. And then within the Gospel of John, it says he's coming out of Jericho. So here's this apparent contradiction. Well, archaeology discovered that there was, at the time of Jesus, two cities. You had the old city that was destroyed by Joshua that was rebuilt there. And then about a mile away was the new city that was founded by Herod. So then you have him coming out of old Jericho, going into new Jericho. And archaeology then resolves this conflict that we find in two Gospels. So instead of going, oh, the Bible must be true... Instead, go, the Bible has usually been proven to be true. Let's hold off a second and just wait for some time until this contradiction gets cleared up, okay? So, what can't archaeology accomplish? What can it accomplish for for us? Well, it can't prove inspiration. Although archaeology can sometimes provide independent evidence for the existence of certain places, persons, or events mentioned in the Bible, it can say nothing at all about whether God had anything to do with it, with any of it, that for the modern believer, as well as for the ancient Israelite, it is a matter of faith. So we can prove that, God, that it happens, but we could never prove that God did it. Like we could prove that the Red Sea was parted, but we can never say that it was God. Okay? Inspiration has to come from something else. So archaeology can never prove inspiration. Archaeology does not prove the Bible to be the word of God. All it can do is confirm the basic historicity or authenticity of a narrative. It can show that a certain incident fits into the time it purports to be from. We shall probably never, writes G.E. Wright, be able to prove that Abraham really existed. But what we can prove is that his life and times, as reflected in the stories about him, fit perfectly within the early second millennium, but imperfectly with any latter period. Does that make sense? Okay. Another example Josh McDowell gives in evidence that demands a verdict. And so let's say the rocks on which the Ten Commandments were written are found. Archaeology can confirm that they were rocks and that the Ten Commandments were written on them and that they came from the same period of Moses it could not prove that God was their source. Okay, So archaeology can corroborate what the Bible is telling us, but it cannot corroborate the, the fact that, um, uh, that the Bible was written by God. Okay, So 
Um, and the other thing that it can't accomplish is it can't verify all of the events that took place in the Bible. It can verify most of them and a lot of them, and we're going to get to in a second. It has verified a lot, but there are some that as Christians, we really wish they'd be verified because the skeptics laugh at it. For example, here is from, I was doing some search online, and one skeptic said this, the archaeological evidence of the Bible is scarce. In fact, it is non-existent. After 200 years of Christian archaeologists digging up the whole Middle East, they haven't found any proof of the exodus of the Jews from Egypt. Hebrew slaves or the ten plagues? None. And this is from a nation of people who wrote everything down in stone. And Sinai has no proof of any large group of people traveling through it ever. The first evidence correlating to the biblical story does not appear in Canaan archaeology until around 100 years before the Babylonian captivity. This lack of evidence includes persons such as David and Solomon who should be recorded in other nations and supposedly live relatively close to those who wrote in the Bible in the Babylonian captivity around 500 BC. Okay, so that's from a skeptic. He's saying, why isn't there more evidence specifically of the Exodus? And when I was studying this, it's a really good question because it's a big deal. You got millions of people that are supposedly living in a culture that recorded everything, and why don't we not have any evidence of them is really the question. Because when it comes to the evidence, there's not a lot as much as you would expect. Well, why is that? In the sob- sopping wet mud of the Delta, no papyrus ever survived whether it is mentions fleeing Hebrews or not. In other words, as the official 13th century archives from the East Delta centers are 100% lost, we cannot expind, expect to find mentions in them of the Hebrews or anybody else. So, the Egyptians, they use papyrus too. But because of where they are in, in a more um, humid area of the Middle East, uh, there is no papyrus found within the Egyptian um, tombs, palaces of anything of that sort. That's what it would be recorded on. Why? Because official records and inscriptions in the near ancient Near East often were written to impress gods and potential enemies. It'd be quite surprising to find an account of the destruction of Pharaoh's army immortalized on the walls of an Egyptian temple. (laughs) Indeed, the absence of direct material evidence of an Israelite sojourn in Egypt is not surprising or as damaging to the Bible's credibility credibility as it first may seem. Now as Jeffrey Sheeler is the Bible true, page 78. So what he's saying there is that they're not going to put it up on their walls because the walls were for the good things they did, right? For, the, for their conquests and things of that sort. Now, I do have to say there are other things that have been corroborated with the Bible. Many, uh, for a long time, they said that Pharaoh, did not, Pharaoh didn't have any chariots, it was impossible from the time that they were supposed to be leaving the Exodus for him to have 600 chariots, but they, given enough time, they found um, stables with enough to hold 500 horses. So here we got some evidence. There has also been um, uh, evidence of um, them whipping slaves and things of that sort of different cultures, so the Jews could be included in, the, included in that also. So the other thing is, is that... Only 1% of the Bible lands area has been excavated, meaning that um, they know where sites are, but they haven't had the scientists to go over there. So 1% of it has actually been dug up, uh, dusted off, and looked through. So one day we might find evidence of the, of the exodus. Another thing is, is that the people were a nomadic people when they were leaving the exodus, and so for them to leave anything behind when you have so little, you shouldn't expect that either. And on top of that, we're talking about the Sinai Desert, and we know how the desert covers up things. So if it's not a city, how are we going to find those kind of things? Where do you dig to pick up a pot that was left by the Israelites? You know? And so there's a lot of reasons we don't have evidence outside of the Bible. But we do have the Bible, which is good enough. Now, tonight our um, primary format is going to be looking at uh, silencing the skeptic. We're not going to be looking at the other two points that I mentioned. I hope you're not going to get tired of hearing skeptics once doubted that blank, 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 and now archaeology, arch, archaeological evidence has proven blank, blank, blank. Okay, That's going to be our study tonight. Skeptics once doubted, now they believe. Burroughs exposes this from Josh McDowell. 
the cause of much excessive unbelief. The excessive skepticism of many liberal theologians stems not from a careful evaluation of available data, but from an enormous predisposition against the supernatural. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to watch Discovery Channel, National Geographic, but how often have you seen things on explaining how the Red Sea was parted or other supernatural events that have been recorded because it's impossible for a supernatural event to take place. Now, what they don't realize is that's being more closed-minded than open-minded because we as Christians sometimes say it happened by natural causes and sometimes we say by supernatural causes. So the Christian is the more open-minded person while the naturalist is closed-minded, which doesn't go over well if you try to tell them that. So I wanted to read a testimony to you that I thought was really interesting. Sir William Ramsey, who was an um, archaeologist um, and a skeptic, he went out to disprove the Bible through archaeology. And I wanted to read, this is, is found on page 62 of New Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. And it says, Sir William Ramsey is regarded as one of the greatest archaeologists ever to have lived. He was a student in the German historical school of the mid-19th century. As a result, he believed that the Book of Acts was a product of mid-century A.D., he was firmly convinced of this belief. In his research to make topographical study of Asia Minor, he was compelled to consider the writings of Luke. As a result, he was forced to do a complete reversal of his beliefs due to the overwhelming evidence uncovered in his research. He spoke of this when he said, I may fairly claim to have entered on this investigation without prejudice in favor of the conclusion, conclusion which I shall now seek to justify to the reader. On the contrary, I began with a mind of unfavorable to it, for the ingenuity and apparent completeness of the Tubigian theory had at one time quite convinced me. It did not then lie in my line of life to investigate in the subject minutely, but more recently I found myself brought into contact with the Book of the Acts as an author um, authority for topography, antiquities, and society in, of Asia Minor. It was gradually borne upon me that in various details the narrative showed me marvelous truth. In fact, beginning with a fixed idea that the work of the essentially a second century com composition and never relying on its evidence as trustworthy for the first century conditions, I gradually came to find it as useful ally in some obscure and difficult investigations. How cool is that? So here's Sir William Ramsey, who was a skeptic, an unbeliever. He takes a Bible over along with him. He's reading the book of Luke. He's in Asia Minor, and he's going, whoa, this is like dead on. And then he's finding that it's helping him make discoveries. And he's, then he ends up turning his life over to Christ because of this. So it's an amazing thing when we look at ar ar archaeology, um, because it's so accurate. I'm using three primary books for the evidence I'm giving you tonight. The first one is the archaeological evidence for the Bible. Um, I'm going to suggest this book to you multiple times. The reason why is it has a lot of pictures, and it's all in color. Um, and, uh, and when you read one page, it's only a paragraph. See, you know, you can do a whole paragraph, and you're like, I've read one page today. It's a great desktop book. It's uh, put out by Charlie Campbell. Most of the information I'm going to give you is out of this book. It's 130-some pages long, and you can find it on alwaysbeready.com. A great, great read on this, this subject. The other book that I'm going to be using tonight that I already have used is The New Evidence That Demands a Verdict. If you want to get in deep into apologetics, that's the book you read. And then the other one is uh, The Case for Christ, which is an awesome book because it's written in a... Um, story form, um, and you get, to, you get to enjoy Lee Strobel's writing uh, capabilities. And so those are the books that I'm going to be using tonight. So there is a wealth, of ac uh, a wealth and accuracy of archaeological evidence for the Bible. Over 25,000 archaeological discoveries. We've heard that before. You've probably read it in books. I was reading in this book by Charlie H. Campbell. He says, by 1958... Donald J. Wiseman, an archaeologist and professor of Assyriology at the University of London, estimated that there were more than 25,000 archaeological discoveries that had, been, that had confirmed the truthfulness of the Bible. 
What is staggering about this enormous number of discoveries is that this was the estimate back, way back in 1958. There have been considerable number of discoveries since then. What I found interesting about this is I've always heard this number, 25,000 discoveries. Always wondered who put that together. And it's interesting that that was put together in 1958. I worked really hard to try to find another person that's put, to, put, that, put a new number together, but no one has. But a lot of the evidence that I'm going to be showing you came from the 60s, um, specifically the 90s. There was a lot of evidence that was found in the 90s. So some of the greatest um, discoveries happened within the last 50 years. So prior to even that, we had 25,000 archaeological facts that could be backed up. All right, so there's a lot of discoveries. And then also, it's, the Bible is incredibly accurate. It's, it's been called the reliable, gui re reliable guide sometimes. Uh, renowned archaeologist Dr. Elat Mazer of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem is so confident in the histor historicity of the Bible, she says, I work with the Bible in one hand and the tools of excavation in the other. Merrill Unger summarizes, Old Testament archaeology has rediscovered whole nations, resurrected important peoples, and in the most astonishing manner filled in historical gaps, adding immeasurably to the knowledge of biblical backgrounds. It is so cool how the Bible is so accurate. So much so, I believe it was in Paul Little's book, but I can't remember because I read a couple books, is where it talked about um, when he was discovering Solomon's um, buildings that he like, drew the gate when he went to the next place, and they dug, and they said, how did you know that? And he said, because the Bible, and it's just so accurate, and it's just so cool. There's people digging right now, spending millions and billions of dollars in Israel, expecting to find oil. Um, there, it's people trust the Bible. Archaeologists trust the Bible. Why? Because it's been so accurate up to this point. Because of that, there's this changing attitude that's taking place. H.M. Orlinsky, in Ancient Israel, discusses a new attitude that has developed regarding the negative results of radical criticism. More and more, the older view that the biblical data were suspect, suspect and even likely to be false unless corrobor corroborated by ex extra-biblical facts is giving way to one that which holds that, by and large, the biblical accounts are more likely to be true than false unless clear-cut evidence from sources outside the Bible dem demonstrates the reverse. What he is saying is this. We've heard of biblical criticism, the idea that unless something outside the Bible confirms what the Bible is saying, then the Bible's false. That's basically the idea of biblical criticism. But it's changing, especially in the areas in the study of archaeology, because the, the evidence weighs so um, in favor of the Bible, that people now are changing their mind. Well, until the Bible has been proven wrong, we're just going to trust that it's there. That's how people deal with the Bible now when it comes to archaeology. I would really, once again, encourage you to get this book um, and read through it, and it's really fascinating um, because it's like listening to a message because you get all the pictures that go along with it as you're going through it. I'm not trying to, like, down, you know, speak down to your intelligence or something, but it's just really good. But I don't have enough time to get through my message tonight, most likely, and so I'm only going to give you 10, the top 10. You know, we all like the top 10, so we're going to do the top 10, right? Top 10 archaeological discoveries. The one that I found the most fascinating, I skipped past a bunch about Abraham, about the flood, but the one that I thought was really fascinating, the first one that came to my mind was Jericho and the study of Jericho. And I wanted to read to you what he said in this book. He says, Jericho is about 10 miles north of the Dead Sea and five miles west of the Jordan River. It is well remembered as the city the Israelites marched around for seven days before God caused the walls to fall down. After excavating at this ancient site in the 1950s, the British archaeologist Kathleen Kenyon claimed that there was not even a city at Jericho, much, much less city walls, at the time when Joshua supposedly conquered it around 1400 BC. Kenyon found the fallen walls of the ancient fortified city at Jericho and a burnt 
ash layer a yard thick, indicating destruction by fire. And she dated the ruins to about 1550 BC, more than a century before Joshua and the Israelites arrived. For years, critics of the Bible cited Kenyon's conclusion as proof that Joshua's con conquest of Jericho was pure legend. But Kenyon's dating has fallen on hard times. A newer examination of the Canaanite pottery found at Jericho by Dr. Bryant Wood, an archaeologist and former professor of Near Eastern Studies at the University of Toronto, has demonstrated that Jericho was conquered around 1400 BC, the very time the Old Testament dates the crossing of the Hebrews into Canaan. Dr. Wood's research was featured in Time magazine article in the 19, in 1990 called Score One for the Bible. So it's pretty cool because if you go over and talk to some archaeologists that don't believe in the Bible, they will still use Kathleen Kenyon's uh, dating, but now it's been overturned. Um, here's some of the stuff they discovered at the site of Jericho. The collapsed walls mentioned in the book of Jericho. Evidence that the walls collapsed at the time the city was destroyed, not latter. For example, under age and decay. Evidence that the city was massively destroyed by fire. Charcoal found in the debris yielded a carbon-14 date of 1410 BC, plus or minus 40 years. Evidence that the destruction occurred at harvest time in the spring, as indicated by the large quality, quantities of grain stored in the city. Evidence that the Israelite siege against the city was short. For example, storehouse, storehouses at Jericho contained untouched sacks of wheat, barley, dates, and lentils, food that would have been used up if there had been a long siege. And you can see Joshua 6, 15 through 20. Evidence that the Israelites were not allowed to use anything they found in the city. So you have all this evidence of there's untouched food that they've discovered in the storehouses there, which points to the fact that it was a quick destruction, um, uh, the fact that it was happened during harvest time, and then you have the fire that it, the Bible t speaks about that happened following the siege. So we have all the evidence right there, and you can go see it even today. If the study of Jericho interests you, and I was going to suggest to Steve we watch this, but is uh, this video called Jericho Unearthed um, by a group called uh, Source Flicks. How many of you guys saw the video, Joseph Smith vs. the Bible? Anyone see that video? Okay. If you ever want to see the best video ever put out on Mormonism, it's called Joseph Smith vs. the Bible by these guys, Expedition Bible. It's just so loving, it's so gentle, and it's so true. And it's just the most powerful video I've ever seen on that topic. Anyway, we showed it a couple years ago on a Wednesday night. But they are the same people that put out this Jericho on Earth video, and it is fascinating, um, just getting into the details more. So there's a lot of evidence right there in Jericho uh, that matches up with the Joshua account of what happened in the city of Jericho. The second thing that I wanted to bring to your attention is um, the Old Testament nations. Now, there are these nations, um, the Philistines, the Hittites, and then also the Assyrian capital of Nineveh that had, was, um, was criticized um, that it ever existed because it was only found in the Bible for so long. Uh, first looking at the Philistines, the Philistines were um, one of the Israel's chief adversaries. Goliath was a Philistine, if you guys remember, in 1 Samuel 17, 3 through 4, the Philistines stood on the mountain on the on one side, with Israel stood on the mountaintop on the other side, with the valley between them. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistine, Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So I wanted to read to you what Charlie Campbell had to say on this evidence here. He says, The Philistines are spoken about often in the Old Testament. Samson, Samuel, Jonathan, Saul, and David all had encounters with them. Some scholars doubted the existence of the Philistines, suggesting that run-ins with them were invented by Jewish scribes to dramatize the military prowess of the mythical Davidic dynasty. Robert Henry Pfeiffer, a seriologist and professor at Harvard, wrote in 1941 of the legendary and fabulous beginnings of the conflict with the Philistines. Once again, though, the turn of the archaeologist's spade has splattered mud on the faces of the critics. Archaeological ex excavations at the Philistine cities of Ashdod, Ekron, Ashkelon, 
and more recently Gath have unearthed a treasure trove of information that confirms the, bi- the biblical portrayal of them, including evidence that the Philistines were indeed expert metal workers as described in 1 Samuel 13, 19 through 22. It's amazing. It's not like we just found one artifact. We found four Philistine cities since 1941. So that's incredible. Even one of the cities that Goliath himself was from. So here's a major overturn um, and showing that the Philistines really did exist. Another group that was um, the people criticized the Bible for is the Hittites. Mentioned numerous, numerous times in the Bible, uh, listed as a nation of the Canaanites uh, brought chariots and horses from Solomon and uh, Bathsheba's first hub- husband, Uriah, he was a Hittite also. Okay, So many people laughed at the very idea that such people ever existed. The Hittite people are mentioned numerous times in the Old Testament. The Bible tells us that they bought chariots and horses from Solomon. Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, was a Hittite. In spite of these and other references to the Hittites, many scholars in the 19th century laughed at the very idea that such a people ever existed or such a language was ever spoken. They used the Hittite legend as evidence against the inspiration of the scriptures, dismissing the Bible's references to them as historically unreliable. That has changed. You cannot find a reputable historian anywhere who doubts the existence of these once mythological people. It's pretty amazing. He continues on to say, Hattashua, the name of the ancient capital of the Hittites, and that's that picture that you see up there, the Hittite kingdom has been located and excavated in modern-day Turkey. Discoveries there include city walls, temples, storehouses, sculptures, king seals, and thousands of written clay tablets that tell us about the Hittite military laws and religion. The University of Chicago has even published a Hittite dictionary. These discoveries lay to rest any doubt that the Hittites were an actual people, just as the Bible said. So now we even have a dictionary on their language, and you could speak Hittite today, but before, they didn't believe they ever existed. Once again, the Bible has been proven to be right. Nineveh. Now, many of us remember the story of Jonah and God's command that he told him to go to Nineveh. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So, his message was of coming judgment. Uh, For the people were exceedingly wicked. The people repented, and God delayed his destruction of the city for about 150 years. Was Nineveh a legendary city, just a part of a big fish story? Some thought so until Austin Henry Laird unearthed it in 1847. The city, once the capital of Assyria, has now been excessively excavated. Remains of its walls, temples, palaces, libraries, moats, and defenses still survive on the eastern bank of the Tigris River opposite the modern city of Mosul in Iraq. The British Museum in London has an entire section of the museum dedicated to the excavated wall reliefs and sculptures from Nineveh. One of the criticism, criticism uh, detractors of the Bible have raised uh, regarding the re- reliability of the book of Jonah centers on the sudden repentance of the Ninevites. It seems far-fetched to critics that a people would go so quickly uh, repent at the preaching of one man. Dr. John Hanna, professor of historical theology at the Dallas Theological Seminary notes that this, however, denies the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. If Jonah had gone to the city during the reign of the Syrian Syrian king, Ashuradan III, the prophet may have found the city psychologically prepared for his message by two foreboding famines and a total solar eclipse on June 2nd, 763 B.C., People in those days often took such events as indicators of divine wrath. So cool. So once again, a lot of evidence. So much so that I was thinking through this as I was like, man, where have I seen um, reliefs like this as you see in the picture? And I realized at the um, LACMA, the Los Angeles County for Museum Museum of Art in L.A., they have reliefs from um, Assyria that are of the Assyrians. And stood before them, their giant walls. And I thought, man, they got this all the way over to L.A. So um, evidence that the Assyrians 
um, existed that Nineveh was the capital city of um, Assyria. King David. Now, um, it's really interesting because I still see documentaries, even after this discovery, that believe that David never existed. What's interesting is they leave out this piece of evidence often, and it's um, so cool because this piece of evidence um, has been featured in Time Magazine and multiple TV TV shows because of um, how often and how people were so quick to criticize a whole nation that praised uh, their King David but had no evidence of him. And this all uh, changed up until 1993. Not a shred of evidence could be found anywhere outside of the Bible that David had ever existed. So it has become fashionable in some academic circles to dismiss the David story as an invention of priestly propagandists who were trying to dignify dignify Israel's past after the Babylonian exile. The critics' verdict that was that David was nothing more than a figure of religious and political myth- mythology. Well, their skepticism regarding David collapsed overnight in 1993 when a nearly 3,000-year-old inscription on a black basalt was discovered in the town of Dan, North Sea of Galilee in Israel. The inscription with an Aramaic... Um, hold on a second. Let's see if I made... Okay. Uh, in Aramaic, mentions the king of Israel, the king of the house of David. This was an amazing discovery and helped to verify for the first time that David was an actual historical figure. So now it has been concluded within um, scholarly circles that David has existed. And since then, there was another uh, piece of evidence. Since the discovery in 1993, another reference to David has been identified on the ancient Moabite stone, or Mishia Stella, discovered in Jordan in 1868. The inscription on the stone commemorates the victories of Misha, king of Moab, over Israel, 2 Kings 3.4, and has a reference to the house of David and the altar hearth of Yahweh, the first clear reference to the God of Israel by name by ancient sources. How cool is that? So now we have two evidences now that David exists. All right, continuing on, and this was the most fascinating one for me. I don't know if you guys got a chance to read Paul Little's book this week, but Babylon is so rich, and I I was really having a hard time um, figuring out what not to say about Babylon because there is so much evidence. We're talking thousands of stones with Nebuchadnezzar's name and stamped on it. I mean, just tons and tons of evidence when it comes to to Babylon. Now the Babylonians Babylonians came against Judah in 605 BC, besieged the city of Jerusalem, and took many Jews back into captivity. So was Babylon a real city? Was Nebuchadnezzar a mythological person? Today you can see excavated ruins of the Babylonian city 25 miles south of Baghdad. So you can uh, see it there. Archaeologists have unearthed the ruins of King Nebuchadnezzar's palaces, temples to his god Murdoch, city walls, houses, pots, pans, metal objects, stone carvings, uh, cuneiform inscriptions, even the likeness of Nebuchadnezzar himself, as you can see in this relief right here. The uh, Perig- uh, Pergamon Museum in Berlin houses a reconstruction of the Ishar Gate, one of the massive lavishly decorated entries that led into the ancient city of Babylon. The gate stands 47 feet tall and was rebuilt with the original blue gate glazed tile bricks that were excavated from the ancient city. Just looking at that picture amazes me. So those are original tiles from the city that was taken. And you can actually, let me go back, I should have done this, but in this picture, can you guys make out that gate right there uh, with, with all the reliefs right there? And then they took it and they brought it to, this, uh, to Berlin. And so that's where it sits now, re- fully reconstructed. So you can get an idea about what Daniel saw and uh, his friends. <clears throat> now, uh, uh, I'll get to that. Okay, the Babylonian chron- Chronicle is the next thing that I wanted to uh, look at. Um, not only was the amazing artifacts excavated, thousands of clay tablets about Babylonian history have been unearthed there. There are known as the Babylonian Chronicle, 
One of the tablets in the British Museum says, in the seventh year, in the month of Kislev, the Babylonian king, who was Nebuchadnezzar, mustered his troops and having marched to the land of Hatti, which is Syria, Palestine, besieged the city of Jer- Judah, which we know as Jerusalem, and on the second day of the month of Ardar, took the city and captured the king. Now the king we know as Jeho- Jehoiakim. He appointed therein a king of his own choice, which was Zedekiah, rece- received its heavy tribute and sent them to Babylon. Doesn't that sound like you just read it directly out of the Bible? Their history matches our, the history of the Bible that we have today. That is incredible. And there's multiple, multiple uh, 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 stones that are discovered in uh, clay that they're still tran- uh, cr- clay tablets they're still trying to translate to get the information from. Then we have the Babylonian furnace. I thought, thought this was really fascinating. In Daniel 3, 19, it says, the Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. Now, an interesting thing, Harold Wilmington, a professor at Liberty University in Virginia, writes, the early excavators at Babylon under, under, sorry, un, uncovered a peculiarly shaped building that at first seemed like a brick kiln. An inscription was found that specified the purpose of this building, and this is what it said. This is the place of burning where men who blasphemed the gods of Chedela died by fire. Wow. So here they discovered one of the furnaces that were used to kill people um, who blasphemed. Interesting, we don't know if this was the exact same one that Meshach, um, uh, Shadrach, and Abednego were actually in, but it very well possibly could be. Um, so we have the, the Babylonian furnace. Seriously, this archaeological um, study has the hardest words to read. Uh, okay. <laughs> Belshazzar, um, which we know in the Bible as the son of Nebuchadnezzar, correct? Okay. Belshazzar, is, it says in Paul E. Little's book, he says, From a host of other discoveries, Daniel's account of the irreverent king Belshazzar stands out. Daniel names Belshazzar as the last king of Babylon. Yet all known Babylonian records list Nabidonius as the last king. An obvious discrepancy, an error. Then it was discovered in a Babylonian chronicle that Nabonidus inexplicably removed himself a 10-year stint in Arabia, leaving the kingdom in the hands of Belshazzar. The confusion came when Nabidonius did not advocate the, king, the kingship. He was still called king. Although Belshazzar was not the sole king, Daniel and the Hebrew young man with him considered him as the de facto king. Prior to the study of Babylonian chronicles, Belshazzar was mentioned only in the biblical record. The archaeologist R.F. Daughtry concludes after his study of these findings of all non-Babylonian records dealing with the situation at the close of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, the description of events in chapter 5 of the book of Daniel ranks next to cuneiform literature and accuracy. Okay, basically it's saying this. They didn't believe that Belshazzar was the last king of Babylonian Babylon because the records up to that point were showing that this other man was the uh, king at that point. But what we have found from this Babylonian chronicle that you can see up on your screen, that he left for 10 years to go on vacation and left it in the place of his son to uh, rule uh, Babylon at that time. And um, what's really interesting is there's even another um, uh, stone that was found that has the prayer of him praying for his son. So it makes it really clear that Belshazzar was the last king of Babylon. Okay. The next discovery we have is Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel 6 account of the story of Daniel in the lion's den, uh, or Daniel 6 is the account of the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Archaeology once again has verified the accuracy of this story. 
Now, it was long considered folklore. Fred Wright explains how that, that has changed. The excavators have proved that just such a punishment was often inflicted upon men in those long ago days. The excavator, de Floy, was working one day among the ruins of Babylon when he fell into what looked like a well. He was rescued by his fellow workmen, and then it was their purpose to determine what the place was. On the curb was an inscription which said, The place of execution where men who angered the king died torn by wild animals. Pretty cool. So he's doing work in Babylon. He falls into this well, into this pit. He's down in the pit, and they're, they're like, well, what is this place? And so they get out, and on the curb, they find this is a place that people are thrown in when they are consumed by wild animals. And so then they find this discovery. Let me re- read this. When the palace at Shusan, also known as Susa, a city mentioned in the books of Nehemiah, Esther, and Daniel, was being excavated, a record was discovered that gave a list of 484 men of high rank who had uh, died in a lion's den. An inscription of the Syrian king Ashurbanabal indicates that the same custom was in vogue in his day. The rest of the people who had rebelled, uh, they threw alive among the bulls and lions, as Shennacherib, king of Assyria, my grandfather used to do. Lo, again, following his footsteps, those men... I threw it into the midst of them. So another discovery that uh, the lion's den was a place that people would be thrown into. Okay, another discovery is the Dead Sea Scrolls. In 1947, a shepherd boy tending his father's sheep in Qumran, north into the west of the Dead Sea in Israel, made an amazing discovery while looking for lost sheep. And here is a map of where Qumran is. There in Qumran, in a cave, a hillside cave that had laid untouched for nearly 2,000 years, he discovered an ancient collection of handwritten copies of the Old Testament. And just to prove that it's a real place, <laughs> there's Brian there. The scrolls had been hidden in caves by the Essenes, a Jewish sect living in Qumran 2,000 years ago. This is the view looking out one of the caves. These scrolls and writings, now known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, represent every book of the Old Testament except the book of Esther. They are considered one of the greatest discoveries in modern times. Some of the containers, uh, these are some of the containers that house the scrolls. And here is Brian taking a picture of some of those scrolls. So now you know it's real. Um, Also, if you guys want to take a look at this book, um, I've always was very curious about this. I had my mother-in-law buy me this book, and I was really grateful when she got me it. This is the Dead Sea Scrolls book put out by the San Diego Natural History Museum. And you know that they had them here in San Diego at one point. What's really cool is you get actual pictures of, of the scrolls and then the English translation underneath it. So if you've ever wondered, what do they look like, how much do we have, and what do they say, um, here's a little piece of it. They don't have, of course, the entirety of it. Um, After years of searching the surrounding caves, copies of every book of the Old Testament have been found except Esther. In some cases, there were multiple copies of the same book. For example, there were 19 copies of the book of Deuteronomy and, oh sorry, I made a typo, multiple copies of the book of Isaiah. 25 copies, sorry, there we go. 19 copies of the book of Isaiah, 25 copies of the book of Deuteronomy, and 30 copies of Psalms. And some of these scrolls uh, dated back to the 3rd century B.C., which is incredibly significant. And if you want to ask me more about that, we can talk about it later. And then we have discovery number seven, the gospel's government, the people that are in government. Now, these are the ones that blew me away. We have Herod the Great. You might have heard of him. Herod was the king in Israel at the time of Jesus' birth that tried to have Jesus killed shortly after he was born. Herod is mentioned by the first century historian Flavius Josephus, but there's a wealth of archaeological evidence of Herod the Great, too. Um, A piece of wine jug dating back to 19 19 BC was uncovered at Masada, Herod's cliffside palace fortress overlooking the Dead Sea. The Latin inscription reads, Herod, King of the Jews, and a 
multiple coins have been just discovered with the name Herod on them. And it's really interesting because that's uh, believed to be the place, according to Josephus, also where Herod, Herod was uh, buried. Then we have um, his son, Herod Antipas, and Herod was the one that cast John the Baptist into prison and then later had him beheaded. Um, this is the place where John was actually killed called um, Maturius, and he uh, has been discovered a few um, miles east of the Dead Sea and modern-day Jordan. So we've discovered also the place where John the Baptist was put to death. Uh, then there's Pontius Pilate, and this is probably the most powerful one of all because this was... Um, a major criticism of the Bible because they said someone so powerful and that has the power to put someone to death by crucifixion, surely he would be included in some kind of writing of some sort or that we'd have some archaeological evidence. Well, there has been a wealth of archaeological evidence and also, um, not a wealth of archaeological evidence, one piece of archaeological evidence and a wealth of historical uh, writing evidence that he existed. New Testament authors tell us that Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea at the time of Christ who oversaw Jesus' trial and then sentenced him to death by crucifixion. He was a legendary figure that the authors of the New Testament invented? No. Josephus spoke of him. The Jewish philosopher Phileo of, of Alexandria mentioned him, as did the Roman historian Tacitus. And now archaeology Archaeology has confirmed his existence as well. In June of 1961, a team of Italian archaeologists was digging in Caesarea on the shore of the beautiful Mediterranean Sea in Israel, about 55 miles northwest of Jerusalem. While clearing away the sand and an overgrowth from the jumbled ruins of a Roman theater, these archaeologists made an amazing discovery. They found a limestone block about three feet tall and two feet white wide that had been turned upside down and reused as part of the flight of steps during one of the renovations of the theater in the 4th century AD. It bore the inscription in Latin dating to 26 to 36 AD, mentioning Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea. The inscription verifies that Pontius Pilate was an actual historical person, that he reigned in the position ascribed to him by the Gospels, and that as perfect as he have had the authority to condemn, or sorry, as prefect, he would have been, have had the authority to condemn or pardon Jesus, just as the gospel accounts report. So an amazing piece of an evidence. And then we have Caiaphas. Now the interesting thing about Caiaphas is that we not, we now, in recent history, not only have one piece of evidence about Caiaphas, but we now have two. Um, in 1990, a team of construction workers were building a water park approximately two miles south of Jerusalem and accidentally unearthed a first century burial grave. How, what a bummer. Because I want, I never looked it up, but I wonder if they built the water park still. You know what I mean? <laughs> or if it was like, it's, it's, you know. Or if they, they, or if they made it just a feature of the water park, you know, like, like Atlantis and go through, I'm just kidding. All right, a bulldozer intentionally broke through the roof of the cave. In the cave were several bone ossuaries stone boxes used in burials. On one of the uncharacteristically ornate ossuaries was the inscription in Aramaic that read, Joseph, the son of Caiaphas, and this is what you see on the screen. Inside the ossuary were the bones of the man who was approximately 60 years old at the time of his death. Although the gospel writers and Josephus referred to the high priest as Caiaphas, Josephus tells us that his full name was Joseph Caiaphas. Uh, Caiaphas, the very name etched into the os ossuary. Even critics of the Bible, like John Dominic Curson, co-founder of the Jesus Seminar, acknowledge that, and this is what he had to say, Caiaphas' name and the names of the family interned with him make it clear that the small shaft tomb was the family resting place for the high priest Caiaphas, mentioned by name in Matthew 26 and John 18 for his role in the crucifixion. This is a direct link to the gospel stories of the crucifixion. And the evidence for Caiaphas does not stop there. Uh, oh, bummer. On June 29, 2011, news came out that an ossuary belonging to the relatives of Caiaphas had been found and identified as authentic by the Israeli Antiquities Authority. So they ended up finding um, the... Uh, 
the ossuaries of his family also. So once again, one of the names used in the Bible is verified as a real person. We actually have his bones um, that shows that he was real. John is criticized often for his, um, for his writing because of the places they say he invented. Some of the places was the pool of um, Siloam. Now uh, that has been discovered. We also have uh, Jacob's well um, that has, has actually never um, been questioned where it was. They built a church over the top of it, the place where Jesus met with the woman at the well. And so that is um, the Greek Orthodox church that built a church over the top of it. And then we have the pool of Bethesda. Now it's really interesting when they first discovered it, they said, well, John is wrong because there's not five porches. Well, as they started doing the excavation, it was exactly as John described it, exactly as the Bible had said. And if they just used the Bible to dig, they would have discovered that it was right. Okay? And then we have Luke. Now a lot of people would criticize Luke, but that has drastically changed. Um, Lee Strobel said in The Case for Christ, one of prominent archaeologists carefully examined Luke's reference to 32 countries, 54 cities, and nine islands, finding not a single mistake. Sir William Ramsey said, Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy. This author should be placed along with the very greatest historians. Luke's history is unsurpassed in respect of its trustworthiness. Um, and I'll spare you all the other information about Luke, Luke, but he talks about multiple cities, multiple facts, multiple people, um, and some of the people, they're like, well, that person never existed, or this person existed at this time. They found that there's two of them, or that it was a different man that he was referring to, and time and time again, things they doubt about Luke. Um, he is one, by far, maybe one of the greatest uh, maybe the greatest um, historian of ancient times. Uh, he, he's unsurpassed in his accuracy. Then um, facts concerning Jesus that are very, very interesting. Um, and I am going to take the time to read this because it's about Jesus. It's super great. Now, one of the things that they found um, was, and one of the things that people did... Um, People doubted is the the doctrine of the deity, correct? Um, people thought that it was an invention of the Roman Catholic Church around uh, the fourth century A.D. But what's interesting now, because of direct archaeological confirmation and mentioning Jesus, was nowhere to be found. The news on November fifth, two thousand five, caused an international stir. It was on that day that Israeli archaeologists announced an amazing discovery in the ghetto in northern Israel. A prison inmate at a maximum security prison, unearthed the remains of one of the oldest Christian churches ever discovered. While digging in the prison yard, Ramiel Razilio discovered a 16 by 32 foot Greek style mosaic floor that bore the inscription mentioning that the building had been built in the memory of the God Jesus Christ. Pottery fragments and coins found at the site revealed that the place of worship was used by local believers and people from a nearby Roman camp, where two legions were garrisoned around 200, uh, 230 A.D. What's powerful about that is it, this archaeological evidence gives um, weight to the fact that the church was teaching the deity within the 3rd century, uh, not, not the 4th. So it's, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the 3rd third, third century. So um, amazing fact there. Also, um, the Bible talks about um, Jesus being crucified and being nailed to the cross. And many medical doctors and historians said that's not true because they would tie them to the cross because the, the bones could not support being uh, penetrated and hanging on the cross. Uh, well, critics of the Bible once again were shown to be wrong in 1968. It was then that a crew of builders from the Israeli Ministry of Housing working in Jerusalem accidentally discovered an ancient Jewish cemetery that contains the, contained the remains of several men who were killed during the Jewish revolt in approximately AD 70. One of the bone ossuaries contained the skeleton of a man who was approximately 24 to 28 years old at the time of his death. His name, Yohanan ben Hargologo, was inscribed in Aramaic on the ossuary. More important than his name was how this man died. 
he was put to death by crucifixion with nails. How was that determined? He still had an iron spike driven through his heel bone. The Romans typically removed the nails from their victims. Iron was expensive, but apparently this nail was too difficult to remove. The tip of the nail had been bent back toward the head, likely the resulting of hitting a knot in the wood. Forensic examination of the rest of the skeletal remains supports the view of Yohanan was crucified with arms spread apart, hung from a horizontal beam or tree branch. Not only does this discovery verify the Roman crucified people uh, crucified people in the first century with nails, the fact that Yohanan was given a proper burial in the ossuary instead of being dumped in a common grave shows that not all crucifixion vi- victims were consigned to the burial grounds of outcasts. Okay, so some amazing history when it comes to the death of Jesus Christ. So here we got the top 10, and these are just the top 10, and there are, there are dozens more in this book, and then 25,000 more. Uh, that you could study if you were interested. Now, let's compare this to other religions of archaeology and see what they have. Specifically, if we look at the study, or if we look at um, Mormonism. As mentioned, there are literally thousands of archaeological discoveries that point to the Bible being an accurate and trustworthy historical document. This is something that has not proven to be the case for other supposed holy books. When it comes to the Book of Mormon, not one piece of evidence has ever been found to support the Book of Mormon. None of the large city it names, no ruins, no coins, no letters or documents, no monuments, nothing in writing, no rivers, no mountains, none of the topography it mentions has ever been identified. Nothing which demonstrates that the Book of Mormon is anything other than an early century piece of American fiction invented by Joseph Smith has ever been found. This is from the uh, the National Geographic Society. Archaeologists and other scholars have long probed the hemisphere's past, and the society does not know of anything found so far that substantiated the Book of Mormon. I'm going to skip past these ones just for the sake of time. Now, one of the more interesting things that I discovered recently in reading this book was about this man, uh, Thomas Stuart Ferguson, a Mormon archaeologist and apologist. So he was an apologist for Mormons and an archaeologist. He dedicated more than 20 years of his life to finding proof for the Book of Mormon. He founded the New World Archaeological Archaeology Foundation at Brigham Young University, which was established for the purpose of unearthing archaeological evidence that would support the Book of Mormon. After utterly failing to find any evidence, this is what he said. With all the great efforts, it can't not be established factually that anyone from Joseph Smith to present day has put his finger on a single point of terrain that was a Book of Mormon geographical place. And the hemisphere has pretty well checked out by the competent people. I must agree with Dee Green, who has told us that to date there is no Book of Mormon geography. I, for one, would be happy if Dee was wrong. You can set Book of Mormon geography down anywhere because it's fictional. A really sad statement. So, Compared to other studies, to other books, the Bible stands out. You can trust the Bible. As one archaeologist said, Bible in one hand, spade in the other. Now, it's really a cool adventure, and I hope I didn't bore you so much that it made you never want to study this topic again, because it is fascinating. This is one of those things that is fascinating to dig into. So, what are you going to do? Well, this is where the application of the message comes in. I would encourage you to go discover. The Bible tells us, seek and you won't find, and that we're supposed to give a ready defense. So I'd encourage you, read this book. There's other books like The Stones Cry Out, or Archaeology in the Bible by Joseph Free, Archaeology in the New Testament by John McRae, or search the internet. One of my favorite sites of all time, and I'd be utterly lost without his site because it's incredible, is alwaysbeready.org. I can't, I'm not making any money off Charlie Campbell anyway, but I'm really, really wanting to encourage you to use this site. He organizes information in such an awesome way that you go on his site, on the left side, you can, uh, he addresses any issue. And what's really cool is that he was a Calvary Chapel pa- pastor at Calvary Chapel Vista, so he's solid both um, in his apologetics and his, in, in his theology. Answers in Genesis and biblicalarchaeology.org are another website you can go to. 
Another cool thing, if you're like, man, I am just fired up. I really am into this archaeology thing. Okay, I'm not this much into archaeology, but say you are. Um, you can actually contact one of these organizations that are on the screen, and they need volunteers really badly, and you can go over and discover the next discovery that verifies the Bible. That's amazing. So take a trip to, to Iraq or Iran or Israel, if that interests you, and, um, you know, with a spade in one hand and some kind of weapon in the other. No, just kidding. Um, and really uh, discover once again, you might be more like Indiana Jones. Um, but getting back to our final conclusion, the Bible is accurate. These are my last two th- slides. Luke, in his opening to his, his book, the Gospel of Luke, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitness and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things which you have been taught. And isn't that the truth? An orderly account. He was careful when he did it. This is the last quote quote I want to leave with you. If you want to look very wise in the world's eyes and are willing to risk looking foolish years from now, you can make a reputation for yourself by pointing out the errors in the Bible. But these things tend to become explained. As time passes and the data from archaeology, historical investigation, numismatics, which is the study of coins, and other dis- disciplines accumulate, these alleged errors tend to explode in the faces of those who propound them. This is the truth. You can say that the Bible is not true because of the fact that nothing has been discovered, but one day... One day, they're going to discover entire cities and nations and documents. I can't believe the things they've discovered in the last 200 years. And so, it's an exciting time to live in. Why don't we go ahead and thank the Lord uh, for our time tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, I do just want to thank you for the evidence that you give. Lord, thank you for um, encouraging us to be scientists, to be those who look for answers. Thank you that you are one that gives the answers. Lord, we look forward to the other 99% being uncovered and finding all of the um, amazing discoveries that are to be found in the field of archaeology. Lord, we pray you would bless the archaeologists, Lord, that are in these dangerous areas. Lord, I pray that you would bless them for their work of bringing validity to the Bible. And thank you that they have taken the time for us that we might find this information. In Jesus' name, amen. With that said, any comments, questions? Angela? What was the third site that you found? Biblicalarchaeology.org. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There is a couple. I've heard that said, but I think, to be intellectually honest, there's a, past, there's a verse in John chapter 5 that points out the deity of Christ in um, the New King James Version that's not in the NIV. Or not the deity, the Trinity. And so that is a major doctrine, but, um, but the Trinity is found other places. So basically what it's saying when that statement is, is that there are no discrepancies that completely destroy any major old doctrine, doctrines we have. But there are a couple passages that are disputed um, that are in our Bibles that do land on some doctrinal issues. Like John chapter 8, there's 12 verses that a lot of people don't believe should be in the Bible about the woman who's caught in adultery. So there's a lot of different sections, but as a whole, we can trust the Bible. So that's the key. You know, I, I mean- in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay? Read that, believe it, accept it, trust it. You know, we're always hearing about new scientific things, but to disprove the Bible. And and it, but my faith takes me back, saying, "No, God created the heavens and the earth. God did this." And so even, but but there were times when we were shaky. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the gap theory and stuff like that. It came out of the fact that, that we, as 
the general population of believers didn't have enough firmness in our faith in the word so we had to make room for this so-called yeah. evolution stuff yeah you see and, it's, and we do that all the time there was another comment i wanted to make and i thought of when you were saying i don't know who said it but some learned man said we have just about educated ourselves to the point of absolute ignorance <laughs> <laughs> you know when you take all these critiques and stuff we get away from faith we want to deal with stuff that's all going to be tangible it's all going to you know we're, we're going to miss out yeah. And God's wisdom, man's wisdom is foolishness to God. Yeah. So apply that all together and yeah. a good picture of that. I feel like God, he, he matches the evidence with the skepticism that he finds in the world. That's what I find, is that skepticism is growing, but then evidence is coming alongside it at the same time, which is, I think, a good thing. Um, but I agree. You, you're not going to verify every single thing in the Bible. But imagine if we required the same thing, or the, these skeptics require of any other book of antiquity or any other faith-based system or of anything anything that you, what you did last week we don't demand that much evidence we take it based off eyewitness accounts that match up and that's what the bible is so we should you know should trust it but i also am very so i i totally agree faith is so important but i also believe that faith is nothing unless it's true and so that's another side of it that we have to have a solid to know it's true first, and then we put our full trust in it, and there's a lot of evidence that the Bible is true, and so we hold on to that. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. Any other questions about archaeology or any other apologetics-based question? Sweet. You guys need to get in a conversation with an atheist. You'll have a lot more questions next week for Steve. <laughs> you know? Find your most skeptical person that you know in your life and talk to them and ask them, what are your biggest questions? And then you'll have good questions next week. All right. Thank you guys so much for coming. Steve will be back this Sunday and uh, next week. All right. Thank you.